I'm Indy Nidell, and this is Out of the Trenches, where I sit here in my chair of wisdom and answer all your questions about the First World War. Uh, Robin Allen from Facebook writes, why were Zeppelins even used if bombers were available? Could they carry more bombs? Zeppelins flew at much higher altitudes than any planes could yet reach during the early stages of the war, so they were basically untouchable. Uh, in addition to this, Zeppelins were much harder to shoot down with ordinary bullets than bombers, as they were made up of many different compartments of hydrogen gas. So if a few were damaged, there were always many more to continue the flight. Also, one of the crew, one of the Zeppelin crew, could run up and down the bridge of the Zeppelin making repairs, and that is not possible in a bomber. A Zeppelin could also carry almost five times as many bombs as any bomber the Germans could field. However, Zeppelin bombers were made obsolete by incendiary bullets and higher flying planes. Uh, another drawback of the Zeppelins was their precision bombing ability was far more limited than that of a plane. The German high command eventually decided to switch to bombers, sent in waves, and in ever greater numbers. Uh, old Genso on Reddit writes, Hello, I really like the show. Um, thank you, Genso, and love the format. My question is a historic method one, so bear with me. It seems that you are only using secondary sources with a particular love for the Great War by Peter Hart. Is this due to time restraints, or is it a production choice? Um, huh. Well, no, that's not quite the case. I use mainly secondary sources, sure, but I use primary sources too when I can get my hands on them. Um, that's a lot tougher for places like the Eastern Front and fronts where the best sources are not translated from languages I don't speak. Uh, I like Peter Hart and I do like The Great War, but it's not actually one of my major sources. Having said that, when Gallipoli was going on, his book on that campaign was one of my major sources there. It's a great book. Um, I write and research all of the regular episodes myself, so yeah, there is a time constraint on my life, but using mainly primary sources and then inferring conclusions from them would be pretty much impossible with only 24 hours in a day. Uh, Eric Granqvist writes, were there any sea battles in the Baltic Sea, for example, between Russia and Germany? There were skirmishes between the Russian and German navies in the Baltic. In July 1915, the Russians sent a small fleet accompanied by one British submarine to bomb Memo, right? But diverted from their task after intercepting a German message notifying them that a German fleet was laying mines in the area. On the 2nd of July, the Russian fleet located the Germans and opened fire on their ships, the SMS Augsburg, the Albatross, and three torpedo boats. This was the Battle of Orland. Uh, the German commander, Karpf, ordered the Albatross to seek shelter in the neutral Swedish waters off the island of Gotland, while the remaining German ships, Ruhn and Lübeck, were ordered to retreat. Uh, the Russian ships, Bogatyr and Oleg, managed to catch up with Albatross and set her ablaze, forcing her to run aground. They later encountered Ruhn and Lübeck, but were forced to retreat when they ran short of ammunition. Uh, the ships Prince Adalbert and Prince Heinrich were sent to support the crippled German ships, but the British, the British submarine, torpedoed Prince Adalbert, which had to limp back to shore. By the end of the day, 27 German sailors were dead. Okay, uh, Brendan Feely on Facebook writes, uh, to what scale was tank warfare used on the other fronts, Russia, Middle East, and so on? When people say World War I tanks, they just think of the Western Front and the iconic images. And attached to that, the Entente was the first to use tanks, but what was their reaction to the first deployed German tanks? Could be a filler for an episode if people keep harping on about tanks. Keep up the great work. Okay, thank you. Uh, nice ending to your question. Um, the British heavy tanks only saw service in Russia after the Great War had ended, as they were given to the White Russian Army during the Civil War there. But they were often captured and used by the Red Army too. Um, the Russians did experiment with their own version of the tank. It was a big departure from the British and French designs. The Tsar tank 
was built a bit like a bicycle, but instead of having two wheels at the back, it had two huge wheels with spokes at the front and one smaller wheel located at the back. The idea was that these huge wheels could cross any terrain in front of them, uh, and there was a turret, a turret with a series of machine guns located between them. The problem with this design was that the two wheels completely obstructed the machine gun's line of fire. But actually, the biggest problem with this design was that the back would carry most of the weight and the little back wheel bogged down the rest of the tank with it. The idea was later abandoned and that tank never saw any action. The only other front that saw the deployment of a Mark 1s, British Mark 1 tanks, uh, was the Middle East, where the British tanks saw action in Palestine at the First Battle of Gaza. Uh, three of these tanks were destroyed by the Ottomans, uh, later replaced and sent into action again at the Second Battle of Gaza. Uh, if you'd like to see me harping on about tanks myself, you can check out our special about their development right here. Please check out our Instagram and our Twitter and all of your dreams will come true. The special ones, the dirty ones, the happy ones, everything you ever thought and wanted in your life. That's what happens when you check out The Great War through social media. See you next time.